Okay. Well, I think th thank you, thank you very much for that. That will be taken on board. That point. Yep. <laughs> Final word on this from Henry, because we must move on to acute care in hospitals next. But, but uh, take that on board. And I mean, that point, just yeah. that point, the excellence has been there and then it's lost and that, you know. Yeah, and uh, this, this can tie into acute care in terms of the discussion, because I, I think that you know, we took a long time uh, over the past few years to try and develop a framework that would help us understand what the training requirements would be for people. It's called promoting excellence. And the promoting excellence framework is, a uh, you know, in my view, it's a, it's a human rights driven approach to how we support people with dementia, and there's different skill levels in that. Now, I, I'm quite confident once we get that rolling out, people will be skilled up to the right level. But what that will mean is the support worker won't be able to do everything that, that we would hope, perhaps, but they'll operate at a skill level. That support worker needs to be working with other people who have got the right skills, and that's the difficulty. Just now, sometimes the way we run our health and social care system is it's almost like you know, if you had a hospital ward, the doctor's not talking to the nurses or talking to the families. So the support workers are out there doing their own thing and they're not getting any help and guidance from psychologists and from psychiatrists. And, you know, if we can bring these people closer together, which is what this model is about, you know, the psychiatrists and people like Peter can say, well, actually, you know, what I'm seeing here is real cognitive decline and issues they, and can advise and support. And then if the coordinators can start to shape the system and the support around that individual's needs, then we'll get somewhere. We spend an awful lot of money, a couple of billion pounds, in a not very good system. If we got that a bit better, you know, and we can, you know, I think that we we start to see huge improvements. Okay, <coughs> thanks, Henry. Let's let's um, let's move on to. Uh, we, we've had a, a load of questions via Facebook on acute care in hospital, and they. I mean, they, they, they're all, they all chime with my experience as well. I mean, people staggered by the lack of understanding in the wards and knowledge of how to provide quality support and care. People made to feel like troublemakers when they raise concerns. Um, patients, you know, going in with one problem and coming out with all sorts of worse problems and somebody saying this wouldn't be tolerated with any other sort of illness, that you went into hospital with one thing and came out with, with three others. Um, so, let me just start, Peter Connolly, with you. Um, where does the responsibility, you know, you're a clinician, for the, 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 the appalling treatment that there often is of people with dementia in hospitals, where, where's the responsibility lie? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, the, well, the responsibility very clearly lies with the system that is delivering the care. So, if you The have system's made out of people. The system is made out of people who are doing what other people feel is the thing to do. And they themselves work within a framework, uh, an environment where you get an idea of what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. And if standards are good, then the whole system works well. If standards are poor, then the whole system works poorly. There are plenty of reports um, from acute and from psychiatric services uh, where uh, people have despite working in a big organization, felt intensely isolated. And the more isolated you become, then the poorer the care becomes. Wards, scandals in some of the long-stay units in England, for instance, um, came from the fact that these folk were, the staff there were neglected for year after year with no training input, with, with no real supervision, with no chance for them to um, examine their own practices through audit, to implement audit standards, to, to change anything. Often the systems, um, the, the framework to make these changes uh, has, uh, has been there, but tends to get modified. The, the, the issues that were made about cost cutting are very relevant in this, that people perceive that good care is somehow more expensive than bad care. And to a certain extent, you know, that's true. Certainly, if you're going to train staff to a level of expertise and have sufficient peer support for your staff, that is not going to necessarily be the cheapest option. Um, but within, within the, the question was about responsibility, and the responsibility certainly lies within the organization that is there to deliver it. Now, the people within the organization range from the chief executive right down to the, the care assistants in the wars, to the domestic um, uh, cleaners, to the porters. All of these people are part of the system. All of these people need to know, for instance, that folk with dementia need time to do things, that relatives don't, shouldn't be restricted to certain visiting hours because that might not suit the way that the person with dementia 
is, uh, uh, is feeling at the time. But if you take it a step back, there's always seems to me that it's a surprise that the acute hospitals are full of older people with dementia. But, well, you know, people getting old isn't a new thing. People getting old is one of the successes of modern living, one of the successes of the NHS, one of the successes of economic development. That's why people have got old. If you get old, age remains the biggest risk factor for dementia. So it's not surprising that a whole host of people who have got old develop dementia. They are as prone, more prone actually, to comorbidities than people who are intellectually intact in old age. So they are more likely to go into hospital. Agitation is one of the biggest risk factors that we know of that um, is a risk for being admitted into an acute hospital. So if you take a situation, for instance, where I'm a very agitated person and Henry's a very calm person and I get a chest <laughs> infection, I get a chest infection, I become more agitated. Nobody can look after me and I get moved into hospital. Henry gets calmer, stays at home, is looked after well at home. And what do people in the acute hospitals complain about? Well, they complain about all these agitated people coming in. But of course, they're being pre-selected out because we're not identifying the agitation in the community and dealing proactively with agitation in the community. So it's not simply a focus on one ward that might be delivering poor care in one part of the organisation. One has to look across the whole spectrum of care if you're going to try and find an answer to this. But, 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 but who's, whose responsibility is it ultimately then? I mean, is it, are, we, are we talking government or are we talking about chief executives of trusts and managers of hospitals? Whose responsibility is it to acknowledge all that, to know it, you'd have thought it was blindingly obvious, and then to, to you know, make the service available in their acute care wards, one that actually tallies with that, yes? Sally, I think the... Malcolm, thank Sally, you. I think the direct answer to your question is that in the 14 territorial health boards, the chief executive, people who occupy jobs like mine, are personally accountable, legally accountable for the quality of care provided. That is a statutory responsibility of clinical governance that is put on my shoulders and the shoulders of, of colleagues within the territorial health board. So that's a, that's a direct answer to your question. The second point I'd want to make is to slightly disagree with, with the previous point. I think poor quality care almost inevitably <coughs> is more expensive than good quality care. So I think if patients are getting uh, moved around hospitals and boarded out to different wards, that almost inevitably is, is more expensive. And I think the thing that we've learned through things like the Scottish Patient Safety Initiative, where 10 years ago things like ventilator associated pneumonia were endemic within hospitals, we actually found that that could be eradicated. There's virtually no ventilator associated pneumonia in hospitals. Length of stay is a shorter amount of medication given it is less, the amount of money is spent is less, and the amount of uh, bed days are less. And then we found all the way through the patient safety initiative that good quality care is actually less expensive and it proves be better outcomes. So, so then you've identified the responsibility then and you've identified that, that uh, you know, the economics of it would suggest that the care should be better. So why is it not happening? Well, I think it is beginning to happen. And one of the things that we have done with Alzheimer's Scotland and with the Social Services Council over the last four years, we've graduated 420 dementia champions in acute settings in hospitals up and down the country. And these are individuals who will work with the Alzheimer's nurses that have been supported by Alzheimer's Scotland uh, in acute general hospitals around the country to champion... But it's uh, still a drop in the ocean, Markham, it is. Sorry? It's a drop in the ocean. It's a move, it, it is a move forward. And if you add to that all of the educational infrastructure that we are putting in place to support and sustain frontline staff in acute settings, so, you know, all of the digital education that we've got, all of the knowledge network that we've got, you know, there's a whole 
uh, infrastructure of practice education facilitators and so forth, right the way throughout the professional groups. We're working with undergraduates at uni university and undergraduates for medical and nursing, postgraduate medical education. We're taking a whole systems approach to developing the acute sector workforce to make things better. Now, are we there yet? We're nowhere near there, but we've moved the ball up the pitch, okay, I'll, I think. I'll take comment from the audience in a minute. I just, Jeff, I know you wanted to come in there. Yeah, I, I guess I was going to say that we, on, we come in each day on the basis that we consider ourselves to be accountable, and that's certainly the basis on which Alex Neal works and the basis on which Nicola Sturgeon works. Um, a lot of our challenge in this agenda is it's not always about excellent clinical care. Um, it's about compassion, it's about understanding, it's about understanding issues to do with nutrition. It's, it's about the fact that somebody in, in, in a, an acute or a, in a general ward may say, see 24 different staff during um, a 12 hour period. So it's some aspects of the, a lot more of this agenda is, is about allowing people to be behave with humanity and compassion um, than it is about you know, excellence in, in clinical practice. What's, what's the Scottish Government doing to force standards up as opposed to well-meaning action plans and recommendations that they rather hope that health boards will take up? Well, the, the, within, the, within the dementia strategy, what we have is we've identified 10 components that we expect to see at each health board. And what does expect to see mean? Um, we, expect there to, we, expect, we expect there to be clear leadership in, t in terms of responsibility for you know, dementia in the area. And the if there isn't clear leadership, what are the, what are the sanctions? Um, what, are the, what are the sanctions? Um, I, I, you know, I, I don't know. In, in Scotland, we don't close hospitals. We don't abolish trusts. We don't... Um, engage in that sort of turmoil, that sort of naming and shaming. Um, Should you? I'm not sure. What, what, what do people think? Let's have some thoughts on this. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, Diane, sh and then. And should, then should we be Brian closing is. hospitals in Scotland if we're not satisfied with the service they provide? Hi, I'm Hands Diane. up, who thinks we should close hospitals in Scotland if we're not satisfied with the service they provide? Jeff's asking. Anybody thinks we should close hospitals? Okay. Yeah, okay. I, I think that was, that was fine. We were diverted there. Yes. Hi, I'm Diane Goldberg. I'm from the National Dementia Carers Action Network. Um, just a couple of points. Um, you were talking about um, consistency in care. Um, when you've met one person with dementia, you've met one person. Mm. So a one-size-fits-all blanket approach just doesn't work. You know, a little action plan that you just apply to every single person it doesn't work and as we all know the disease is progressive so people will come in in various conditions and will come out with different conditions as well it's about making sure that regardless of what stage they're at that the consistency in the care that they get continues from being at home to being in hospital to come back home again my second point is really around um, you were talking um, Peter about, it's about older people in hospital this isn't a disease that just affects older people my mum was diagnosed at 54 and in hospital at 56 with no support whatsoever because she didn't tick the right box. She didn't tick the box at home to have the right care. She didn't tick the box in hospital. Therefore, we couldn't get her out of hospital because we had fights with different pots of money because no package of care suited someone under 65. I hope it's a lot better now. My mum's a little bit older now, but the fight just seems to go on. But don't forget the younger people under 65 as well, because they still matter too. Thanks very much, Jan. Could you pass the... Uh, my name is Caroline Cluckshank. I've looked after my mother single-handedly for 13 years. She's in the final, final stages of Alzheimer's, although I was told initially, you don't die of Alzheimer's. But my mother is actually healthier than I am, although she's a, virtually a vegetable. My experience was the Western Hospital in Edinburgh, my mother was vomiting blood. I got the ambulance in the morning. I, I agree with what Sally says in her experience of hospital. The ambulance took her in. Unfortunately, I had to go over to the west to a friend's funeral. I was delivering the eulogy, so I couldn't go with my mother. I arrived in the hospital at night thinking everything would be fine. She was still lying on the same thing, gurney, do they call them? They had done nothing because the person in charge of the ward said my mother was refusing to give blood. And the only way they could take blood without um, abusing her was to get her sectioned. I created, put it mildly, I demanded to see the consultant. He was too busy to, t to see me, but believe you me, he arrived. 
Uh, we got him there, and I argued and argued and argued, and he said, okay then, what I'll do to pacify you is we'll give her um, a sedative, and then we'll take the blood. So not only was my mother abused once, she was abused twice. Three days later, she still had the same blood and sickness in her hair that she was when she was admitted. And also, I would stupidly said she's incontinent, so she was lying in a urine-soaked bed in this day and age in the Western General Hospital in Edinburgh. That was my experience, and I wasn't happy about it, and I got no apology, apart from one guy on the board telling me, oh, we've got some screamers in tonight. I thought it was appalling. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, any more hands up? No. L Leslie, can I... Oh, sorry. Yeah. Some of that, obviously, very uh, powerful testament. Sure but is. I think one of the th questions that it exposes is about why people end up in hospital in the first place. And I think that's one of the things that we need to focus on. So, yes, the experience is hugely important uh, once people arrive in hospital. But um, as my grand said, uh, old age doesn't come itself. And often people enter into hospital with lots of different problems. Dementia might be one of them, but there, there's often others as well. And that's one of the things that makes the um, care in hospital um, uh, all the more difficult. But the, 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 the thing we should really focus on is to, um, preventing people coming into hospital in the first place. And, and it's um, about thinking through what we can do to try and realise that goal. And what, one of the what, things, what can we do? Well, one of the things that I, I was taken by in your book, Sally, was your observation about getting IV antibiotics delivered at home. Um, what I would like to see, in a sense, is almost break down the walls that we have built up around about hospitals over the last 50 years in Scotland. We have this, um, I th personally think, this bizarre um, protection of hospitals in, in Scotland. We, we must never, we must never reduce hospital capacity. It should always be retained at whatever cost. Actually, I don't agree with that at all. I think one of the things that we have to be much more creative with into the future is using all of the resource that we use and put into acute hospitals and using that differently because we spend a vast amount of money in acute care and it's important and it is important for people who really need it um, but there's an awful lot of people in hospitals who do not need to be there mm -hmm. and that's where we should really be investing what, what, what would it take then and, and Peter are you the person to answer this what, I mean, what would it take to actually get more acute care done at home for instance IV antibiotics uh, the staff, the staff to do it. Now, um, I mean, the the, um, I mean, firstly, I mean, I have to say, you know, that experience that I just heard, yeah. uh, if that was unique, you know, I would be amazed. And and you know, I'm, I'm, well, I, I've heard this kind of story so often in the last thirty years that it's surprising that you know little has been done. And the one, the one. The one thing I would say is, you know, if, if I run into trouble, and I'll, I'll answer the question in a second, Sally, but if I run into trouble at home with something that I don't know what to do, then I usually call for help for people who do know what they're doing. And yet there seems to be, whether it's a, a care, a support worker, an untrained person, but, you know, a, a, an unregistered person, let's say, who's had experience of dealing with people with dementia, there's no reason why, you know, in theory, we couldn't be having a mixed you know, group of staff in the wards with, with the sort of people who can deliver this while the nurses are doing, you know, because you have to realise nurses are really pretty stretched while they're doing all this work. And other people could be doing the washing, the hair, and the soothing, and the kind of person-centred stuff that would have probably helped your mother. But we have, um, as an example, and we say, you know, I don't want to close beds. When I started in Perth, we had 180 beds. Now we've got 24. Not one of these has been closed by a consultant psychiatrist, by the way, I have to say in answer to the earlier point. But laterally, we, we, we closed um, 12 beds uh, and we moved the staff into the community. Now, we halved, uh, no, sorry, we didn't halve. We um, reduced the admissions to hospital by 80% um, by doing that, simply because we were able to, oops, we were able to extend um, the hours in which we were able to go into people's homes um, we were able to do a lot more with the person with dementia. We were able to do a lot more in the way of dealing with the problems of the carer and the family. Um, we had more time to spend with people because we had the skilled staff available to do that. We've also looked at if we shut down, uh, and, and when we shut down these, these um, 12 beds, um, at the same point, 85 care home beds opened. 
So one has to say, well, just who is doing the protectionism here? Which sector should we be looking at? We reduced the, the level of admission of people um, from our geographical area into care homes. It's now 20% less than uh, any of the three other areas in Perthshire. If we were able to translate that into money, that's about four million pounds a year that could be happened if every, that could be created if every area in Persia had the same level of admissions to care homes as we have in our area where we have the trained staff in, in the community. Now for four million pounds, I could do everything I've ever wanted to do in improving services, but I can't because it's impossible to overcome this system where you have this care slope where people start at home, they end up maybe in sheltered accommodation, then in res residential accommodation, then more nursing accommodation, and it's really difficult to get back up. Right, so the only way to do it is to prevent the people going in the first place, and the best way we've found to do that is to have the trained staff available in the community. So how do we overcome the system here? So I'll make a couple of points just about acute care, because I think it's really crucial in, in the story that you've told we've heard so many times. And in fact, I think that 1994, I was talking to a couple of our members, there was an Alzheimer disease at a national conference here, and one of the, the platform plenary talks was about acute care. It's taken a long time for us to really understand this problem. Uh, I mean, the government made dementia priority only in 2007. The first national dementia strategy was 2010. So Peter says that, that we should know this stuff. Now, the truth is, is that I don't think we did. And when we talked to chief executives about the size and scale of the number of people going through acute care with dementia and explained their negative experiences and indeed the economic cost of that, that's a recent surprise to people. So I, I actually think we're only now at a point where we've got people's attention. And, and, and it's on, we're only now, and it's terrible that we have to say that, but we can't be anything other than honest. People about so that now that you've got attention, yeah, sorry, because well we're going to have to yeah. move on rather okay. swiftly. Could you, could you address Well, ba well the basically, uh, what, what I, I, it's a really important point for me because I think that there's, there are very few people set out to do a bad job. Very few people set out to do a bad job in the day. But when you're not equipped and you've got a busy acute ward and you've got five or six staff, none of them trained in dementia, trying to deal with a third of the people in that, that environment who have dementia, you're going to fail. The job of the Dementia Champions is not a two-hour training, it's a five-day training programme to upskill staff in the front line, and the changes they've brought about are phenomenal. The job of the Alzheimer's Scotland nurse consultants is systemic change at a high level. But what about that Ron's point that we should be doing more of it at home? Well, well I, I think that that's a comp that's different debate from acute care. If we need to improve acute care at the same time as getting the fact, stop people going to hospital. Now, I know. So many, so many issues here, isn't there? Yeah. quick the point, <laughs> practically in terms of people ending up in hospital is trying to make sure the GPs have access to all the options when they're making that decision. At the moment the GP can pick up the phone and get admission to hospital. That's what they can do so that's what they do do. They cannot pick up the phone and get uh, an intensive home care package. They cannot pick up the the, the phone and get an admission a, a, a 72 hour admission to a care home. So and it, it, the danger is that the traffic keeps going towards acute and then back out as opposed to how do we hold situations in the community and look at the best options and bring the services to the person rather than the person going, in, you know, going into the hospital. So I, I think there is a bit about, it's, there are some practical things that we can do that could actually lead to better decisions being made at that point of crisis or difficulty and, and not to have <coughs> the default admission to hospital. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
it's like a lower scale. You've got these girls who could be zoned into areas. You're saving time, you're saving money, you're saving petrol. You're covering far more than you're not looking at the real problem. Uh, thank you for that. Malcolm, training. Training. When are you <coughs> going to get them better trained? I, I, I think training is, is absolutely key, and I, I think it goes beyond training health service staff. I think it's about training social care staff, and I think it's about supporting carers and, and training it, people who are working in the independent sector. And I think we've got to get beyond that that's a health service member of staff, that's from social care, that's from... How do you get beyond well, that? Well, what, well one, of the, one of the things we, we, can, we can do, and, and we are doing, is having I think, networks of, of people who supervise and mentor uh, frontline staff who can who can supervise and develop their practice. So we've actually built, and I think this is one of the things that Scotland has got ahead of anywhere else in the United Kingdom, is is an educational infrastructure that at the top end has got the whole digital network of resources that can be made available to frontline staff, and has got a system of educational facilitators that support and mentor frontline staff moving forward. And I think that that system that the health service has got and we're developing it jointly with social care, we need to extend right the way across the piece. So if you work in the independent sector, you're just as entitled to get it. Anna? Yeah, just to um, come in from the social care point of view, which is what, what you were talking <coughs> about there, um, and also to come in with a regulatory hat on, which shall we say I'm being billed as someone who's interested in developing and educating, with a regulator hat on. The social care workforce in terms of care at home workers are about to become regulated. And that means they will have to meet certain standards of qualification. It's not just the standards, we know that's being looked at and being addressed. It's the handling of them. Instead of being put to one end of the suitcase, yes. having to be yep. held over to the other end of the suitcase, Absolutely. making the one person late yep. for the second period that's of right. driving, and it's a double up, and it's a domino effect that all yep. days are getting yep. to the there's, there's a lot wrong with how these things are organised, and I'm not saying that registration addresses that part of it. That's another thing, and Ronald and I discuss this on a you know, weekly basis almost, but that, and it is um, an issue for local services to try and really think about that <coughs> and to work with partners. But just on that basis of the, um, of the qualifications and the skills, there are lots of people who have those skills already, but not nearly enough, and there will be a regulatory mandate for that to happen coming up over the next couple of years. And to address the point that the, the lady made there with, with my hard hat as regulator hat on again, is complain and complain and complain and complain and complain to regulators. Don't just complain in the, um, within the system itself. Go to the General Medical Council, go to the Nursing and Midwifery Council, go to Health Improvement Scotland, do all that and absolutely do not give up on that. Thank you. Of course, you shouldn't need to do it. You shouldn't. No. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. You shouldn't need to do that. But that it, it doesn't have me concentrate the mind. Yeah. Well, listen, thank you. for. I'm, I'm really sorry to interrupt you. I, we could allow this particular bit to go on for the rest of the session, but we wouldn't be able to cover anything else. So I think I'm going to be a little bit ruthless and move us on now to residential care. Um, 